Good morning and welcome to a new edition of the Arsenal Opinion Podcast. This is Therapy Session. I've got Jacob Hawley with me. I've got Matt Candela. I'm Pedro. and We're going to get down to it. There's lots of stuff to talk about this week. How are you doing, Matt Candela? I'm doing good, mate. Yeah. I mean, how else do you feel when you've won seven on the trot to start the year? I feel too good. I feel too good. Jacob, how are you doing? Yeah, almost so good that I don't need the therapy, but I'm trying to remind myself, thing with therapy, it's an ongoing thing. You don't just do it when you're in crisis. You, you do it all the time to keep things up. So, yeah, feeling good, man. This, this is preventative, just in case. Yeah. It's like this a workout. Is. It's like a workout. Yeah. Jacob, there's a there's a phrase, what goes on tour stays on tour. You are on tour this week. Does any like dangerous stuff happen on tour when you're a comedian? <laughs> no, wow. mate, it's so boring. Honestly, can compared to music, be honest. I, no, mate. I, okay, how, how honest do I want to be? I expected, I expected much more rock and roll. The reality is, I'll get a, a Tesco meal deal to eat on the train. I'll meet my support act on the train. I'm about to ask him to bring a spare notepad because I've lost mine. Uh, and we will have, we will share four tins of lager on the train home. That is it. It's no, there's no rock and roll at all. The the, the fun starts and stops on the stage with my tour. Do you do you drink before or is it like you got to be, I, no, have I'm your wits bit, about you? I'm a bit superstitious that I don't. I don't have a drink until after I'm done. Um, not That's not because of anything that's ever gone wrong. I just, uh, yeah, it's always been my superstition. Drink drink when the job's done. So Total I'll, I'll pro, this. total pro. Well, this podcast is going to be professional today. We've got loads of stuff to chat through, but there is a little tradition. Hottest of takes. Hottest of takes. Three hottest of takes. The AOP, hottest of takes. Make it spicy. Macandela, because your beard is looking so good today, I'm going to let you have this week's hottest of takes. Where are you taking it? Um, my hottest of takes is um, everything is going so well. Um, but the inevitability is you can't win every game till the end of the season. I think it's, it's just one of those things. And so I think that the really crucial aspect of the season is how when there is an element of disappointment, um, how we respond to it, both as a team and as a fan base. And I think just thinking ahead to Saturday now, it's a must win game and we really can't be dropping points to Brentford. But if we did, it wouldn't mean that the title challenge is over. It wouldn't mean that we're suddenly shit. It wouldn't mean that seven wins and a draw from the first eight games of this calendar year is not um, pretty much perfection. And you just look at the way Manchester City dropped points to Chelsea, um, and just but that but overall the trend is 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 super strong. So um, I'm not anticipating us dropping points, but I'm just sounding the warning that we can't win every game between now and the end of the season. I think that is impossible. It would mean that we won, you know, our last. 17 odd games of the season to win the league and I just don't think that's a reality even though people will say well that's what it's going to take so uh, my hottest of takes is there will be disappointment uh, even though we're all flying high and can't imagine it right now and when it comes we have to be emotionally and mentally prepared to absorb it and overcome it tempering expectations is that is that spicy or is that cold is that a cold take Hmm. We'll, we'll we'll think about that. We'll think about that, Jacob. Ouch! Ouch! I mean, <laughs> you you did it. You're supposed to you're sp pile on the enthusiasm, Jacob. Are you going to spice it up, or are you gonna are you gonna give us a, a stone cold freezing one as well? I'm I'm going hot, and I, I uh, I'm ready for the ridicule this might bring. I think we're going to do it. I've oh. I've oh. I've got to a point where I think we're actually going to do it. I've. And it's, it feels insane that watching us beat maybe one of the worst Premier League teams I've seen us play away from home ever was the was the fixture that made us made me believe. I'm I'm looking at us and I don't see a more informed side in the Premier League, maybe in Europe. I watched Real Madrid last night. I I wasn't scared. I th I think we can win one one of these major competitions. I think I think we're playing at a level. I think we've found a way of playing. I think we've actually found two or three ways of playing now, which, which can beat any team I think our biggest challenges are away from home and that's where we look the best I, th I think we're ready to do this and I think these players there, there is something about 
the aura they gave off in that Sheffield United game where I thought, you, you've you turned a corner. There are enough adults in the room now. There's enough confidence in your own abilities. And every single one of those players is hitting form at the exact right time. I, I think, I, I believe. I, it's the first time I've really felt it this season. I believe. That's that's spicier. That's spicy. Okay, so uh, uh, I don't even I don't even know where to go. I don't even know where to go with my hottest of, of takes today. I think, but I, I I think to to back up Matt, I, I think his point about um, things are a little too good at the moment, and when things are this good, and you're in that sort of dreamland where you're like nothing can go wrong, something goes wrong, and um, I, I I would say my hottest of takes today kind of leans off of Matt's cold take as well. I think um, I think Brentford's going to be difficult this weekend. I think Arsenal haven't gone a goal down domestically since 2023. Well, and when I say goal down by a player, um, an opposition player, the last time we went a goal down domestically was the FA Cup, and Kivior scored it. So we haven't we we haven't had a, a anybody put a goal past us. And I I I'm I'm with Matt. It's like. The, my my thing is less about how the fans react and more about how um, the players react. When you haven't felt pain for a long time, and then you turn up, you turn up against Brentford, and Ivan Tony slices a ball into the net after a disgusting counter attack. It can rock the team, and um, it's all about how we react to something bad happening now. Because, like Matt said, absolute perfection over the last few weeks, and. I don't. I don't think the. I don't think the undoing is going to come at Man City. I think that the the problems are going to happen in a game like Brentford, where no one's expecting it, where we're rolling in, and um, I'm I'm a little bit worried about this weekend. So I've got a cold take as well. Ice cold. Joining Matt. It's basically the same Jeez, thing. Jeez, we need to rebrand. Boys, we do the Brent, coldest of takes. Brentford are crap. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I I know everyone's going to say you're jinxing it. They're rubbish. They've got their, like, I think all of their first choice defence are going to be unavailable this weekend. Ivan Tony can't run anymore. If there's a counter-attack, he's watching it with the rest of us. Like, we're going to be fine. Jacob, 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 just, just I'll, I'll tell you, and this is why we have these therapy sessions. Yeah. I, I have been hurt so many times by Arsenal. I have. I have. And especially in the months of November, March, April and May. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you know, March was that period where we were always flying. And there was even talk, oh, maybe Arsenal are going to do the treble, the double, the this, the that. And then every week in a month of May, in a month of March, we went out of everything. We we go out the FA Cup, we go out the Champions League, and we have a really awful loss in the Premier League. And so I just want I need to protect myself. I think that's what I'm doing. I'm I, I hear myself. you. I just, I do you know what? Ahead of Sheffield United the other night, I I was watching Monday Night Football and Thierry Henry was saying he was a bit nervy about that game, and I was actually a bit nervy about that game as well. I think it was something about the fact that we were on last of the weekend, you know, City and Liverpool yeah. had already done what they need to do, and then within like ninety seconds, you're like, oh, this is going to be fine. Yeah. Like li literally within ninety seconds, we'd hit the bar. Martin Elliott had one on cleared off the line. You go, oh no, this is going to be. I, I know what you're saying that we've been hurt before. I don't know if I've been hurt by Declan Rice or William That's Saliba or, or Kai Havertz. They, these are a group of serious guys, six foot two, six foot three, six foot four monsters. And I think they really, really, really want something this season. And I think maybe that's being forgotten about with the whole narrative of City always win it and the narrative of Klopp's little farewell tour where at the end of the you know campaign, they're giving four trophies and they stick his teeth on a plinth in the Premier League halls. I, honestly, I, th I think the fact that we're being forgotten about suits us. I don't think these guys are going to break our hearts in the way that other teams have. This is why it's the Thursday therapy session. I'm feeling <laughs> better already. I'm feeling better already. Well, that is a nice segue uh, into the first topic of conversation. Let's just get it out of the way. Let's talk about the Manchester City Liverpool game that's coming on Sunday. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's the clash everybody wants. It's Pep versus Klopp. It's the last time we're going to see it um, for a very long time. Uh, it's a huge game, but the big question always is, uh, you know, which arm would you rather chew off in this scenario? Um, Matt, where are you going? Uh, left or right arm? Manchester City or Liverpool? Who do you want to win in this game and what sort of game state are we hoping for? Um, I've given it a lot of thought, obviously. 
Um, and I think the obvious answer is that we want to draw uh, because then you've got two opponents dropping two points each and draws feel like defeats almost at the moment. You know, you, you remember the response when, when City uh, drew with Chelsea, it felt like they'd lost. Um, so the obvious place is that. Um, however, um, I do wonder whether... I've always believed that anyone who finishes above Manchester City will win the league. And I think they're way more dangerous than Liverpool. And I think Liverpool have been outperforming XG. I think they've been extremely lucky. So I do wonder whether the better long-term result might be a Liverpool win. Um, I think the worst result for us is a City win. And I think that's the most likely result. Jacob, you've been thinking about this one all week. Where do you where does your heart where does your head say the result is going, but where does your heart want it to go? Or is it the same for both? My my head actually, I, I've I've got a funny feeling about a Liverpool winning this. I've got a funny feeling that the the narrative points towards Klopp getting one over him at his final opportunity at Anfield. Matt's right, we want a draw. We want both teams dropping points. We want something. I mean, if we've been honest about what we want, we want rotten lasagna being served from every canteen possible. We want we want a pitch that looks like a swamp. We want hamstrings tweaking like the strings of a violin. We, we, we want everything to go wrong for both teams. And what we do want, big one, we want yellow cards for Rodri because they're stacking up. And if he gets suspended, that's where they're going to really drop points. Um, oh, imagine yeah, if I, Rodri got a red card and missed the Arsenal oh! game. Now, it, uh, well, here's one for you. We, would you would you take a City loss and a, a sorry a City win and a Rodri red card, or a draw but Rodri doesn't get any cards? I think I'd take the City win with the Rodri red card. Yeah, <laughs> I think I would. I think that's I would. what we're all praying for now. So yeah, I I think we want to draw. It, it, it's going to be fascinating because I I think what Matt alludes to is correct that this there is the danger of this becoming a statement win for a manchester city team who have been here and done this before and that would really set them up for that game at the etihad with us so i think yeah we 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 want something dispiriting some something we want cards or, or red for rodri and we just don't want city to set themselves up to be champions of the premier league the other way of looking at it is i think city are playing the five of the top six in the next five games or something crazy Whereas yeah. Liverpool's run is actually the easiest of all the teams. The and the City game is probably one of the main chances for them to drop points. So you do wonder whether we just t- take the... take the, I think it's so delicately poised, isn't it? Mm. And the bit I'm a bit unclear on, I need to look into it, is Liverpool have got a load of injuries, but they're not all till the end of the season. They will no. be getting players back. And so you don't want them to get players back in a, in a, in a managing to have held on all this time with a shadow squad. Well, uh, here's a way of looking at it. I want Liverpool to get absolutely shellacked at, at the weekend. I I know that City winning another title isn't isn't ideal for anybody, but Liverpool have Liverpool are on a on a precipice at the end of the season, a real tipping point for where they're going to be. If if you take away all of those last minute goals which aren't sustainable, They'd probably be fifth or sixth in the league right now. The the, the narrative, the, the winds of Klopp's farewell tour are really like propping them up this season and just a boatload of luck. I mean, that Paul Tierney decision at the weekend was nothing short of disgusting. Um, but Liverpool have been getting that all season and they've been burning red hot. It it doesn't last. We've seen that we saw how tired they were in 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 that league cup. And the reason that I think they're going to get walloped is that Manchester City are in no mood uh, for for narratives. I think they've been absolutely brutal. No one's talking about it because it's so expected at the moment. But the bigger picture here for me is we don't want a Liverpool title win. Like, firstly, that's not good for the Arsenal narrative. Secondly, it gives it gives Liverpool belief. It gives players that are thinking of leaving a reason to stay on for an extra year. And I just think that Liverpool finishing third this season with maybe a cup double, they're going to lose Klopp. They've got no sporting director. Michael Edwards, um, the guy that brought them all the success, is apparently saying no to returning to Liverpool, which is great news. They're going to lose a majority of their coaching staff. Virgil van Dijk um, might exit. Alisson might exit. And then you've got to replace generational players, generational coaches, 
Uh, you've got to find a sporting director that can hit the ground running. And all of this against the backdrop of an ownership group that wants to sell. To get Liverpool to a state where they were five years ago, they've probably got to spend three, four hundred million. Three, four hundred million. Salah might leave in the summer. If Liverpool win, it just might keep the squad together for another year. It might attract someone like Jabby Alonso. Um, I, I want them to have the bad years after Arsene Wenger left Arsenal. And that starts with Manchester City walloping them, slapping the belief out of them. And then it just becomes a bit of a two-horse race between Arsenal and City, the two most deserving teams um, on paper in the league this season. You don't like that. You got to like that. I see your faces. Uh, I'm just, I'm just... Let's just have a draw. Let's just have a draw. <laughs> it's just anything that would give too much spirit to either team would frighten me a bit, you know? Any, anything that would really lift... Like a 4-0 Liverpool win... I think sets them up to do it. Cause as you say, Matt, they've actually got a much easier run in than the rest of us. If City do spank them, I just I don't see a world in which City spank them and then somehow lose against us a few weeks later and then don't win the title. Like I I, I Yeah, I just don't think they're that, I just don't think Liverpool are that good. I I and they we we took them apart uh in the in the Premier League. We were super unlucky in uh, the two prior games. I just I think Liverpool are flattering to deceive at the moment, and I I don't I think it would be a, a false hope if you think that you can smack Liverpool up and then do the same to Arsenal. I think that, but, but, that but I think City the reality Arsenal is will be. you look at Villa and you look at Spurs and the way that they're notching wins. They used to, I mean, I think even last year you'd say, oh, any team can beat any team, but we're getting to a little point now where the top teams are winning all their games, every game. Villa are, are like that. Top Spurs are like that. You know, they're like seven points behind us or whatever. And we've had one of our best seasons ever. So um, that's my fear is that Liverpool c can just, they, they may not be the best team, but they've still got enough to beat all these teams. I mean, there's only 10 games to go. Everyone's a cup final. They're not in the Champions League. They could they could, they could, could do it. Um, I've always said, I think Liverpool will fall away in April and we'll be getting really, really anxious until then. And I stand by that, but I will get nervous if they if they beat City. Yeah, if they beat City, then I feel like the narrative really has taken a grip. But I don't, I don't, I don't believe in narratives as much as everybody else. So we'll see. All right, let's get on to some Arsenal stuff. Um, I need, I, I need some support out here. I'm watching uh, the Zinchenko rumors that uh, Newcastle and Bayern Munich are going to come in for him in the summer. That Arsenal are open to selling him, and I'm watching Arsenal fans uh, absolutely rip the player apart, despite our defense being really good before Christmas, despite him only having one error that has led to a goal this season. Um, I feel like we're moving into extreme first world luxurious problems when we're looking at Zinchenko and saying, yeah, it would be all right to get rid of him this summer. Um, Jacob, what's going on here? Do you Is, is this fair? Have, have we just got to a point where everything is so good that we can look at a four-time Premier League winner and say, ah, let's get rid of him. Let's get rid of him this summer. What do you think? Oh, I, for me, there's kind of two separate issues here. One of them is the fact that I completely agree with you, mate, that Zinchenko has got a really weird rep amongst our fans. As a player who came in uh, summer before last and I think changed things as much as Gabriel Jesus did, I think has had as big an influence on the team, I think changed the way we play, changed the way we build up from the back. I, I think we look a much better player with him in the team until the last six or seven weeks or so. Um yeah, he, he's got... I, I don't really get what it is that winds people up about him so much. I can't put my finger on it. I don't know whether it's that he's a... He plays in our back line but isn't really a defender. I don't know if it's people don't like that. I don't know whether it's because he feels more Manchester City. I mean, I've noticed Gabriel Jesus getting more stick this year than in other years. I, I wonder if whether those two don't really feel like Arsenal players. I think the injury thing deserves a mention. I think the fact that he is as unavailable as Jesus has been, really... I think you know, yeah. we, we we brought him in as a Tierney replacement because Tierney was so unreliable. He's almost as unreliable as Tierney. I think there might be I some. Disagree. I disagree. I think there might be some some sort of I don't know. I don't want to say personality stuff. He's a very emotional player. I can't tell whether that winds people up. I don't really know. I I completely agree with you that he does not deserve the criticism he gets. However, I could see him being sold in the summer. And the only reason I say that, I think we've changed shape in the last six or seven weeks. And I think having a fullback who stays a little bit further outside, 
who cradles that defence a bit more and who, who gives us a bit more of a physical presence has brought the best out of Martinelli. I think it's helped the midfield balance. I, I, I don't I, I don't know if I want to go back to having a, a left back who inverts and stands next to Declan Rice in the way that Zinchenko did for the first sort of 15 games of the season. So I think there's going to be a surprise sale in the summer is my theory. And my if I was put uh if I was to point at a player, I think it might be one of the fullbacks. I know there's noise that White is going to sign his contract, but that contract negotiation seems to be going on for a really long time, the Ben White one. Um and then the Zinchenko stuff. I, I just I, I I've said this a lot. I can't shake the feeling that um, that Yuri and Timber came in to take someone's shirt and we never really got to find out whose shirt he was there to take. And if there's a sale that needs to happen this summer, I think the defence is where we look the most stacked and the most able to lose someone who we consider a regular starter. Zinchenko's 27 years old. He'll have two years left on his contract. I've got to be honest, with the injury record, I, I wouldn't want to give him another contract on the kind of wage that he's on that would take him into his 30s. If, if Bayern Munich are going to come in with 45 million quid, I think you're insane to turn it down. Matt, I'm feeling the pain in Jacob's voice because I know he didn't want to say those things, but he had to. He had to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> be honest about the realities and availability is definitely a problem. But to counter the to counter this a little bit, Manchester City won four Premier Leagues with Zinchenko doing 20, 25 games a season. We seem to be getting to a point where there are no weak links in the defence other than Suarez. Would it be better to just add one more body and then have lots of rotation options? Or do you think at 27 years old, this might be the last chance to get a bit of money in and maybe invest in a younger a younger body? I love Sinchenko. I don't think he's going anywhere. I really do. I just think um, the game that really stood out for me was when we played Manchester United three and we won 3-2 last season. And we were absolutely battering them at the end for the last like 20 minutes. And Sinchenko from left back, was literally playing like a left eight. It was just, and it was, meanwhile, he was also covering, as a, he's a covering defender. And the bravery to be able and willing to do that and know that if the ball goes over your head, you can still get to it. If you're under pressure, you can get to it. If someone's pressing you, you can beat the press. He is a Mikel Arteta player. He's David Raya-esque in his bravery and ability to play on the front foot and play forward. So I, I think he's, he's phenomenal, I think. Um, we're all a bit bl blinded and blinkered by the recent form. But, I mean, it was December where we were up against deep blocks like West Ham and didn't get the result. And I don't think we've just now found the solution for deep block. I think there's going to be deep blocks between now and the end of the season that are really frustrating. And I think having an extra person in midfield with the ability to break the lines like Sinchenko is going to be really, really crucial. But I think he's going to have a really big part in the run-in. So, so, so that's that's that. But why does he have this like negative? Why does he have this sort of negative association? And I think the biggest way I can think about it was the Liverpool game last year, um, and maybe a couple of others. But it sort of culminated in that. For me, the Liverpool away game last year was the moment we lost the league because we're two 0 up. We're playing absolutely brilliantly, and by the end, we've been absolutely pummeled. We've been really lucky not to lose. And suddenly the doubts had crept in for the first time. And I know that it wasn't even that bad a result, but in the grand scheme of things, it felt like it was. And the sort of the culmination of that was Sinchenko getting absolutely skinned and being at fault for this, for that goal. And I think that everyone can picture that moment. Everyone can picture that, that game state. And suddenly there's this sense that Sinchenko is unreliable defensively, one-on-one. -on -one. Now, do I think that's the case? I don't think that's the case. I think it's. I think he is reliable. I think he was up against one of I, the best players. The numbers point to him being very, very reliable. Very reliable. And then, obviously, earlier in the season, again, at Liverpool, it's Mo Salah got the better of him. But it wasn't a calamitous mistake. It was Mo Salah being Mo Salah, and he does it to every single team in the league and every single team in the Champions League. So what are you going to do? But I think those two moments where it just feels like he, there's a vulnerability against a certain type of player um, have tarnished him. And I think that's the level we're at. Ben White, you know, the games against Matoma and Rashford have made people question whether he can defend one-on-one -on -one as well. But I think it's also the, the structure. So I think he's a fantastic player. I don't think he's going anywhere. I think he's staying. I think he's an Arteta-esque perfect player. I think it'd be great if he could be more available. But I think he will be available for the run-in, and that's when it's really going to matter. So... 
uh, keep him at all costs. Can I can I put you on the spot, Matt? Mm. Would you give him a new contract in the summer? Um, I would. I really? Would. And you? Yeah. And would you turn down the forty-five mil from abroad? I don't know who's paying forty-five million for Zinchenko. <laughs> I mean, we paid what 35. 30, 25, 35. 35, and he was three years three years younger or whatever. So, or two, you know. So, I don't think. I don't think we're getting 45 million for him. I think it's who's available on the market, but we've finally got this rock solid unit. And I think people are slightly, what, who are the two players that, that are making us feel like it's okay to let Zinchenko go? One is Timber, who's played about 40 minutes for us. We've got no idea whether he's going to work as a signing. True. We're basing it all on preseason, but yet we're all convinced that he's, you know, the answer to everything. He may not be. And then the other one is Kivior. Kivio's not a left back. You know, I know he's playing well at left back, but he's also played Burnley, uh, Sheffield United, West Ham, Palace, you know. Liverpool? Liverpool, mate. Liverpool, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying he's not a good player, but I don't think, I don't think he's even going to be playing left back for us. I think he's, I think it's a stopgap and we've made it work. But ultimately, he's a centre half. He's good on the ball and has, and has done good. But I, I don't think Kivio's playing left back for the running. The uh, uh, there's a there's a Pep Guardiola quote from 2017, and he was talking about John Stones, and he was quite aggressive in the press conference. And don't know whether you remember it. He said John Stones has more personality than all of us here together in this room, and more balls as well. And I remember that because John Stones was getting hammered for making errors, but Pep asks him to play certain roles and do certain things, and there's a a, a, a high risk, high reward nature to that. And when we played against Newcastle, that that Newcastle game, remember that Newcastle game where they absolutely battered us? One of the big takeaways from Arteta and his team was that we lacked bravery. Aaron Ramsdale was going long. Um, I don't know whether we had Rob holding in that game. Uh, it was it was just it was an embarrassing mess of a game, and we lacked bravery. One player in this team that you'd put your house on to do something brave in a Champions League semi-final is Zinchenko. Um, I I think that I, I think we severely underestimate how good he is. I think he's one of the few players that gets injured and his reputation gets worse. You know, you remember Abu Dhabi? We'd be like, remember that Liverpool game? Remember that Liverpool game? And then he come back in the side. You're like, oh, he's he's not Liverpool. Abu Dhabi. Aaron, Aaron Ramsey as well. Like we'd always imagine that he was like some giant of a player and he wasn't. And Zinchenko is a giant of a player. And there's no number that you can look at that says we're a worse team with him in it. There's no defensive number that you can look at that says that he's a poor defender. But I do think um, the rotation option is probably the option for him moving forward. My thing is... Yeah, there might be 45 million on the table. I, I doubt it as well. I don't think many clubs are going to take a risk on those calves. But having a great squad is how you win Champions Leagues and league titles year after year. And having somebody in the side that's 27 years old, that's basically won it all, um, that can be used as a rotation option, that's the next level for, for Arsenal, in, in my opinion. Be, being able to have a tactical weapon like Zinchenko and having the option that no manager can really plan against you because it's like, is it Timber? Is it Kivior? Is it uh, Zinchenko? Is it going to be Tommy Yasu over on the left? I think the optionality is what we lacked at the start of the season and it's what's helping us in the back end. So I think he's going to stay. I think Arteta loves him. I just think that he'll have a reduced role because he's. I don't think his body can handle it. Um, and I, I, I'd, I'd be surprised if the rumours are because somebody's interested in him or the rumours are there because the agent is trying to nudge Arsenal into getting him a new deal. All right, that was a that that was that was a spicier spicier conversation than I expected. Um let's move on to uh, XG Masters of the Universe. I know that uh, people call me a, a, a an XG merchant and it's true. I absolutely love those numbers. I, I prefer them to the real Premier League. But there was this great um tweet that went up yesterday from uh, at analytic underscore footy, a guy, guy named Simon. Uh, anybody that works in football analytics has uh, a beard 
looks like they could be a barista in a in a in a fancy coffee shop in North London. Simon says Manchester City have been top for the XG difference every single season since Pep joined in 16-17. Arsenal are on track to break that streak for the first time this season. Really, still going. Uh, it, it really is understated how good we are at the moment, guys. I know that these stats and these tables shouldn't get me as excited as they do, but there is there's nowhere to look in the Premier League at the moment. There's nowhere there's there's no spreadsheet you can lift up and say this is the problem. We're the best team in Europe at the moment, without a shadow of a doubt. But we're still third favourites for the league. Jacob, does that suit Arsenal after last season? Do, do, do you like knowing that we're underlying statistic heroes um, and that nobody's really giving us a chance? Is that is that good for a young team? It's it's what leads me to my hottest take that I, th- I think we can do it and I think we might do it. I <clears throat> Every week I read more numbers that suggest we're going to do it. Every week there is more evidence that points to the fact that we are playing like a team that does end up winning stuff like this. And this isn't like a freak occurrence. That that's that's what I have to keep reminding myself. I keep getting that that pang of anxiety, that flash of oh the bubble's going to burst, and then I remind myself this isn't pot luck. Like no one's on a sort of Joe Willock, Newcastle, Steve Bruce style hot streak that's going to end soon. We've been trending towards this for quite a long time. We've been steadily building, steadily adding things, steadily getting better, and the numbers have just gone up. And you have to look at the next like three months and think, why why would the numbers go down? Like what what obviously there's that Etihad fixture. Aside from that, where are we gonna suddenly start conceding goals? Why would we suddenly stop scoring goals? We we've not got like a single point of failure, a Haaland who might, you know, do a hamstring and then we stop scoring. Everyone across the pitch is scoring goals. We've got so many different ways of creating chances between but you know between set pieces, between between the way we build up from, from, from the back, between the way that we transition on people quickly, between creating turnovers where we press defences. Like, this all works. Do you know what I mean? We, we, we have to keep reminding ourselves that, like, the, none of this is an accident. It all works. And it, and we're getting better week in, week out. Like, this is real. The, the numbers should be telling us this is real and we don't need to get as anxious as we are. Matt. These underlying statistics, they've been floating around for a very long time um, and performance matches. So it's not like a sleight of hand, like it was uh, maybe season two of the Arteta project where it was, you know, I was coming on the podcast. I say, we're, we're top of the, uh, the, the, the second half of the season table. The underlying statistics point towards us getting better. These are real underlying stats backed by real performance on the pitch. Does this start to feel to you, Matt, like uh, 1998 post Christmas when uh, when they had that big team meeting? Um, maybe, like I, like I hope so. I think. I mean, you've got to remember we were underperforming XG at the end of last year, which is that two months ago. Now we're overperforming XG. We're overperforming. You know, our XG against Sheffield United was. 1. No, we were overperforming our XG last year. And we're, no, we're, yeah, but I'm yeah. talking about the end, like just that, that spell before Christmas, where oh, okay. the, the numbers were good, but we weren't scoring the goals. Now, you know, our XG against Sheffield United was 1.84. We scored six goals, so you can't have it both ways. But now we're overperforming XG when we're battering all these teams. So our XG isn't six or or four. You know, it's 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 under that. So long may it continue, but I think it's always the case of let's just keep our feet on the ground a little bit and go. We normally end up in the normally everything balances out over a season. And the question is, is our XG going to be enough to win the league? And I think it's going to be really, really close. Obviously, I'm delighted by what by what's happening. But if we think that just because we we're smashing everyone now, we're going to smash everyone to the end of the season, then I think we're going to be massively disappointed. I think there's going to be games where we're up against deep blocks, where we're reliant on set pieces for breakthroughs where we need a bit of luck from the ref for a penalty, from a bit of VAR, all of that sort of stuff. So I don't want to just suddenly say that everything is is hunky-dory, um, but certainly it's, it's, it's tracking in the right direction. The big question for me is, have we peaked at the right time? Did, I think we're going to get, you know, we, we had seven wins in a row. Like, was now the right time to get seven wins in a row or was the last seven games of the season when we've got all those tough away games the right time to get seven in a row? And can we do both? 
that's, that's well, sort of it. you have to you have to do a last twenty run if you're going against Man City. That's right? what it seems like. Yeah. So let's um let's just I'm just going to challenge you on your uh your XG slander. Going to put some real numbers up here so you can see the sort of places I hang out in the evenings. <laughs> uh, so the actual points in the the Premier League um, oh, since Dubai. So um, Manchester City shaving us by uh, one point at the moment. Uh, if you look at expected points, uh, we are that basically suggests that we we should have two less points. Man, Man City should have 3.74 less points. Liverpool, 3.77 less points. So we're, we're but, not... But, but, we're, but look up, look at the difference between XG and the goal scored. We're overperforming that massively, right? But but an XG of 1.8 against Sheffield United, to, it, we're still winning the game. Yeah. Like we might, we, the only thing we're overperforming is scoring more goals is the difference between winning and battering. Maybe we shouldn't be battering as many teams. Yeah. But yeah. It's, not like, it's not like Spurs. Where it's like they shouldn't be winning games, or Liverpool, they shouldn't be winning games. So, one hundred percent. But it's still amazing. I keep on looking at that Premier League table, and I'm like, our our goal difference is disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting what this team has done. Isn't it insane we, though that we've been on this run and we're still third? I know, I know. It, but it, I, I am, I'm kind of of the of the mindset. Last season, I think. Being top of the league for so long, what was it like? Ninety percent of the season, I think that that got to us in the end. I think getting Sky Sports putting a graphic up after you win six nil, saying that you've only got fourteen percent chance of winning the league, that's fodder for Arteta. No one expects you to win the league this year, so just go out and do it. And I do, I do think in the nineteen ninety seven, nineteen ninety eight season, Matt, it was the same. No one yeah. thought that we would win the league, and yeah. we just chalk up win after win after win after win. And I think. If the best the best way for Arsenal to win their first league title is not dominating from the start, I think it's coming up behind and uh, and sneaking it, and then you build that winning IP, and then being top isn't such a pressure because you've won that trophy. Uh, okay, all right, let's move on to uh, let's the totally subjective, totally subjective uh, question that I want to uh, bring on here, and I'm going to share uh, a little image. So this this section of the podcast is called Winning in the Tunnel. Uh, so I've got a picture from uh, the internet. You've all seen it. It's uh, David Raya, Ben White, Saliba, Gabriel, uh, Kivior and Declan Rice looking over at the Sheffield United players, making them look very small. This is like when you've you've chatted to the wrong girl in a bar and then there's a lot of tall guys looking at you and they're going to give you an absolute whooping outside. Uh, guys, I, I know that sometimes when things are going well, you read into everything as, uh, as 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 amazing. I want to talk about beating teams in the tunnel because I've spoken to people um, uh, at Arsenal that were around during the the invincible era of Arsenal, and they would say Arsenal would have teams like Derby beaten in the tunnel well before the game, and the best Manchester United teams had teams beaten in the tunnel and referees beaten in the tunnel. This Manchester City side right now, people are writing off the game three, four weeks out. They know they've got absolutely no chance. Arsenal have not had that scary magic stardust, but I think we're starting to get to it now because Sheffield United did not look like they had a plan for us and they looked beaten after 50 minutes. Um, Jacob, do you believe that you can beat a team in the tunnel with reputation alone? Um, what do you think? 100%. Hundred percent. I, th I think I think we're frightening teams. <clears throat> I think I think if you're a team who has any kind of uncertainty, be it with your manager, be it with your fans, be it with one of your players, and you look at the fixture list and you see Arsenal come into town, you you wet your knickers. You're in trouble. We're we're coming to empty your stadium. We're coming to embarrass you. We're coming to put you in a position where your manager has to answer difficult questions in press conferences. <clears throat> and when you look at that tunnel now. I mean, it's one thing I was going to ask you, Pete, when I was looking at that image. How does it change if it's Zinchenko stood two places back there? Is that is that still as intimidating? Zinchenko is the small guy in a bar, and you bump into him, <laughs> and you're like, "Oh, fuck off, mate!" And then it, then he pulls out <laughs> some mad shit, and then his mates he's, turn up. Yeah, he's he's biting your neck or something like that. He's, uh, he's yeah. doing something really outrageous. 
You know, it's it's funny because we've obviously got City coming up, and that that's the I don't want to look past Brentford or, or indeed Porto, which is a huge game, and I'm I'm buzzing for that. I'm going to that, and I haven't I haven't been uh, in my seat in ages. Um, I think back. I I can't remember if it was last season or the season before where there was an incident on the touchline where De Bruyne had a little bit of not quite fisticuffs, but a bit of a push and a pull with Arteta. Do you remember that? Yeah. And I I didn't love that because at the time I remember thinking, I wish someone was backing him up. And if you could just picture right now how De Bruyne might feel if he went to sort of have a bit of a push and a pull with Arteta and looked around and saw Gabriel, Saliba, Kivior, Declan Rice all stood there. David Raya as well. Let's have a right. Interesting facts about David Raya, by the way. I, I noticed the other day that he, uh, he's he got a very sort of like almost sort of ski slope model-esque nose. Have you noticed that? And it's I thought, lovely nose. Well, he, he, well, he has got a lovely nose. And I thought to myself, has he had a nose job? Well, that's, that's funny for a, a sort of pr- an active Premier League player to, to have had a nose job. It, do you know what it is? It's a nasty nose break that he had it's fixed. Exactly that. Yeah. When he was at Blackburn many, many, many moons ago, some, someone wrapped their shin around his face, bless him, and he had to have ah. his, his, his nose put back together. Anyway, um, Kardashian noses aside, we, we, got some, we got some serious monsters in the tunnel now. And... If I think back to the Arsenal I grew up with, I grew up with the the Invincibles and and the team just before that, Petit, Dixon, players like that. We were always, the foundation of our team was a big physical team who could play football. And then after that, with the move to the Emirates, we moved to a sort of smaller, tactical, younger, and it was that way for a very long time. And I feel like we're back to having our wall at the back now. And we're scary. Matt, what do you make of uh, beating teams in the tunnel? Do you think we've got an intimidating crop of uh, of young players now? Are they starting to put fear into opposition players? I mean, I just think you always used to just... The thing about great Arsenal teams is it was, if you want to play, we'll beat you. If you want to fight, we'll beat you. And I think that's what we lost over the years because it was, they don't, Arsenal don't like it up and they don't like coming up to wet away games up north. Uh, they're small uh, all of those sorts of things. And now we've managed to just completely overcome that. And I'm so pleased because the Premier League is just, you've got to have a certain size to you. I just don't think you can be diminutive. You know, City have got your Bernardo Silvers, but they've also got your Harlands, your Rodgers, your big defenders, your Edisons, all of that sort of stuff. So I think we've got the perfect balance. Um, I think we are intimidating people early. I love to see it. Um, I used to love it in the crowded tunnel at Highbury and you see Vieira and all those like Thierry Henry coming out and they just, they look like racehorses. Even Pires, they, even Pires, by the way, the, the archetypal French playmaker, six foot three. Yeah, all big, all, all, all big players. So um, so I think it makes a difference and I think, you know, long, long may it continue. Um, but I did love that. It's, it's, if we go on and win something, I think... Uh, that image will become quite iconic. Zinchenko, do you remember train spotting? Zinchenko's <laughs> Begbie. He's Begbie. I thought you might say that. Yeah, you don't expect it, but don't mess with Zinchenko. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you guys. I, I, I still can't believe that the biggest confusion, oh, the biggest confusion, that's bad English, the, the thing that confused me most about the Wenger era was going from having Tony Adams, Patrick Vieira, Petit, um, Going from that to like, I think that we just need really small players that are technicians. We don't need physicality to win in the Premier League. That was one of the weirdest pivots I can ever remember. Just a- absolutely bizarre. And I love that Arteta has come in and, and, and addressed it. He wants a big, intimidating team that can go toe to toe with anybody. And I do think one of the, you know, one of his realizations against Manchester City last year was they they were much more physical than us. They pushed us around a bit, and he's more than addressed that. This time around, Kai Havertz, Declan Rice have been absolutely magnificent signings. Um, I do want to talk about, I, I, I was going to talk about Kai the Magnificent. I only put it in there to wind you up a little bit, Jacob, because I know that you went quite hard at young Kai at the start of the season. But there I've is a. I've come round. I've come you, round. I you love are, him. I love you're him, all man. in. I mean, I will say my caveat at the start of the season, I always said I think he's a striker and not a midfielder. And I, I really feel, feel that way now. But what is he? He's an eight, a nine, and a ten, right? We don't even know what he is. He's a false. He's just nine. Kai. He's I, just I, ours. I think he's a false nine now, but I, I hear your point. So there's a there's a little piece in the Daily Mail at the moment 
says that David Raya is now the best goalkeeper in the Premier League statistically <laughs> this season. He's had nothing to do. Um, <laughs> but his save his save ratio is up there. His long passes are there. He's short passing. His ability coming from crosses has been absolutely um, outrageous. Kai Havertz is uh, scoring some unbelievable goals. Uh, he's brilliant in that left eight position. I think he offers so much more than Jacka. He's faster. He's cuter. Um, he's got more tools in the Arsenal um, than than Granite Xhaka, and he can play in more positions. Is it time for Arsenal fans to reassess the summer because we didn't feel this way in uh, in November? And it, are we going to start realizing that it always takes six months for players to bed into this Arteta system? Because even Declan Rice, I know he's been good from the start, but the things he's doing in the attack in third at the moment, did anybody expect that? I mean, he's free kicks. I mean, everybody. Everybody that Arsenal bought in the summer is getting better and better and better. Is it time to stop doubting this talent yeah. recruitment that we've got? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm actually nervous about Ramsdale playing this weekend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I and I'm, I'm like, who would have thought that? But I'm like, we've got a great unit. David Rye is so calm. Everyone's got used to him. I love the way he plays. His distribution's so good. He keeps things out. And now we've got... Now I'm a bit worried about the anxiety and Ramsdale sort of gets my heart racing a little bit my in a brother good way, is, but also not such a good way. My, my brother always sends me a picture. He's like, when Aaron Ramsdale is about to play, he sends me a picture. Do you remember when Aaron Ramsdale, I think it was against Southampton, he saw a pigeon and he started watching a pigeon before Southampton <laughs> scored a goal. That that That's Aaron Ramsdale. So, I, I love the player, but that really is Aaron Ramsdale. It's like the Simpsons, Homer Simpsons in a butterfly or something. It was... Uh, Jacob, yeah. What, I, what have you made of the summer signings? Is it time to say um, 10, out, I, 10 out of 10s across I the think, board? I think you're bang on, mate. I think you're 100% bang on. And I, 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 let's not pretend that we haven't dropped points in games this season. Let's not pretend that we haven't dropped four points against Fulham and there weren't points in those games where we could have got a bit more from some yeah. of those signings. Let's, let's not pretend that... I, I look back at the Newcastle game we lost. I don't think Raya was great for that uh, for that goal that we conceded. I thought the, the Chelsea goal where Mudrick scored, we dropped points at Stamford Bridge. Let's let's not pretend that because they're good now, it, it doesn't matter that they were a bit off at the start of the season because we might come back at the end of this season and for all the graphs telling us we've got the best XG in history and for all the, the stares that we give people in the tunnel, we come second in the league because we, we fucked up at Stamford Bridge at Newcastle. And, and drop points in games we didn't need to. So, so let, let's not pretend that the fact that they were a bit off in the first half of the season didn't cost us points, because it did. But looking at where we are with them all now, I, I just we're a different team to this time last year. We're just more serious. Everything's more serious. We're, yes. we're, that, the thing that's going to drive me mad on, on Saturday, I'm less worried about him looking at pigeons. I'm more worried about him turning around and sticking his tongue out at Brentford fans when I want him throwing the ball straight to Martinelli. That's that's one of the biggest things with David Royer. No, no arsing around. Just, just get it out. Just, just, just get it, get it out to people quickly. There's, there's other players across. You know, Kai, Kai's finish against Sheffield United, by the way, so good. One of my favourites of the season. A proper striker's goal. <laughs> yeah, just, just slots it. It, it was like, it was like a snooker finish. Just across the board, into the court, side netting. That's as nice as we've seen one of our forwards do. And I've, I've got to be really honest with you, boys, and this is a conversation for another day. I'm feeling very differently about what we need to do this summer. When I've, I've watched Trossard, Havertz, and we know we've got Jesus coming back, all doing that number nine position, all in different ways, but all very effectively. You know, when there's nothing on the market screaming out to be bought, I'm I'm really liking what we got at home. Declan Rice, I think you're bang on what you say, Pete, that he's improved. He's he's improved massively. And I love when he gets a chance. It's a bit like when when you let the horse properly run, when he goes left eight. <laughs> you know, you sit a six he next gallops. to him and go, have, have a gallop today, boy. We're gonna take the reins off, take the blinders off. You you have a good old <laughs> run around the paddock. Though, mate, those legs, when he gets going, it, and it's also what it does for our press from the front. That imagine that 
Imagine you're, you're a, a, a lower level Premier League centre back and, you know, you, you're already having a bit of a torrid season. You've conceded a lot of goals and you, you turn up and you go, right, I've got Kai Havertz running behind me. He's got legs coming out of his ears. He's going to get onto every loose ball. And then as soon as I get the ball from my keeper, I've got Erdegaard and Declan Rice running at me like maniacs. It, it, we must be the most stressful team to play against. And so much of that is down to Havertz and Rice. They, they've been sensational. And Declan's a big boy. But when, when he stands at still, the, his sprint from a standing position, when he's like, oh, fuck it, I'm going to run for this. You're like, whoa. He, he's, he's, I, I would say he's one of the uh, – when he gets up to speed, he's one of the fastest players in the team. Completely agree. Like, and that's, and that's you just don't notice it. And then until you see him gallop. The recovery like, pace is unreal. Just how, how many times is, are we in a negative situation? And then, oh, it's okay. The, the ground, the ground that he covers, Matt, it's ridiculous. I mean, I tell you what, I, I, I've got to hold my hands up. I spent a good sort of two or three months start of this season going, oh, but he can't do what Thomas Party does. He can't drop his shoulder and pass around corners. He, he can't do a one touch, blah blah blah. And I tell you what, as soon as Party came on that pitch against Sheffield United, I was going, oh, he can't run. Oh, he can't recover. Oh, he can't do what Declan Rice does. And that really shows that the baton's been passed. It does. It does. So we're we're gonna we're gonna finish up the podcast on a, on that little joyful note. Um, unless anybody's got anything else that they want to say, but I feel like we've had a, a good a good therapy session today. Got a lot out in the open. It's good for guys to talk. Have you enjoyed it? Predictions for the weekend. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go three one. I feel good, man. I I can't. This this train don't stop here, boys. It really doesn't. Three one. Matt, 4-0. And now it's going to be a one-all, isn't it? But <laughs> I'm going to go, yeah, I'm going to go 2-1. Arsenal go a goal down after like 20 minutes. Like we're going to have to have a little bit of uh, something go wrong. We're not, we're not quite Man City yet, but I still think we we'll might win. need a bit of that. We might need a bit. That might do us good, you know. I, I've been thinking this about the Porto tie, that turning something around will really do us a bit of good. Maybe turning something around against Brentford would really do us good. Agree. Okay. All right. Well, that takes us to the end of the show. Um, you've been listening to Jacob Hawley. Jacob, where can they find you on the internet? Uh, Instagram at Jacob Hawley. Be lovely to see some more gooners on there. Um, Matt Candela, where can they find you on the internet? You can find me at Matt Candela on, on Twitter or X or whatever, whatever the hell we call it now. Fantastic. The only platform that didn't go down this week, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and if you have enjoyed listening to this, we have a Patreon. You go to patreon.com forward slash the Arsenal opinion. And if you've got this in your ears and you're listening to it on the train, open up your app, give us a little five star review, leave a nice little note as well, because we love those notes. They power the podcast. Um, and on that note, we'll be back for a before the whistle on Patreon tomorrow. We'll be live on the whistle on uh, on Saturday. And we might even sneak a, a cheeky one in after that massive Manchester City Liverpool game as Jacob said it is a game of jeopardy for somebody out there I don't know whether you did say that you might not have but um we'll just pretend that you did it's a uh, good line I'll take it it's it is it is a good line it is a good line and I will say on that note ciao for now thanks for listening